Hi, my name is Atif Darus, professor and consultant of obstetrics and gynecology. Today, uh, I would like to discuss an important topic with the undergraduates and postgraduates as well, which is pelvic pain. How to diagnose pelvic pain and how to treat pelvic pain. You know that pelvic pain is a bad feeling for any person. But if you look to pelvic pain from a physician point of view, you will find it a good event for you as a doctor to diagnose what is the cause of this pain and to reach for a proper treatment of this case. So your job is not to prescribe analgesics or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or uh, just to alleviate pain. Your job is to search for the cause of this pain and try to uh, find out this cause and prevent complications of the cause of this pain. So if you imagine a patient with uh, pain due to appendicitis, for example, and you, do, you did not diagnose the cause, this leads to perforation of the appendix and peritonitis. The same applies for ectopic pregnancy, if not early diagnosed due to the complaints of pain and so on. So you can miss a, the patient herself due to internal hemorrhage and so on. So diagnosing the cause of pain is our task uh, as physicians. Generally speaking, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with uh, or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. The patient says that I uh, feel that some something is stabbing my abdomen or so. So it is similar to tissue damage. And this is the most recent definition of pain by the International uh, Society. Uh, of pain. And if we look to our topic, which is pelvic pain, it may be acute pelvic pain or maybe chronic pelvic pain. Acute pelvic pain occurs in the last three months. It is not just appeared now, it can start within three months from now. So this is called acute pelvic pain. If it is more than six months from, from now, this is called chronic pelvic pain. Many authors and many societies mentioned that it should be permanent uh, pelvic pain and repetitive and not uh, cyclic. But others uh, argue that cyclic pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain should be included in the definition. And in this talk, I include cyclic pelvic pain as a cause of chronic pelvic pain. One of the examples is congestive dysmenorrhea, mid cyclic pain, exaggerated mid cyclic pain, and so on. So chronic pelvic pain is a broad term, which includes pain lasts for six months or more from now, okay? And acute is three months or less from now. It may be due to gynecologic or non-gynecologic. Gynecologic will be discussed in details later on. And non-gynecologic, including gastrointestinal, psychological, urological, musculoskeletal, as mentioned by uh, many societies. Now we will focus on pelvic pain, not abdominal pain. And pelvic pain, you have to put in your mind the regions of the abdomen. When the patient comes to you with pelvic pain, you have to know that the abdomen has nine regions. So your patient has a pelvic pain. So you have to look at the uh, suprapubic area and right and iliac fossa, uh, fossae, and this may be the cause of pain. What are the organs in these uh, regions or the nine regions of the abdomen. If you look at the suprapubic uh, uh, area, you will find the and skin, the anterior abdominal wall, the renal bladder, the uterus, the rectum, the sacrum. These are the organs. So the pain may originate from the anterior abdominal wall, from the skin itself, 
uh, from the anterior abdominal wall muscles, from the urinary bladder due to retention or cystites, from uterus due to fibroids, adenomyosis uh, due to uh, inflammation like myometrites, endometrites, due to pelvic inflammatory disease, which includes endometrium, myometrium, and others, uh, due to endometriosis, this is the uh, genital organ cause of suprapelvic pain, maybe due to rectum or the sacrum and back. If you look at the right iliac fossa, of course, you have to think of a bin sites as a common cause of right iliac fossa pain and Crohn's disease, hernia. These are gastrointestinal causes, renal causes like uretic stones or crystals, uh, renal colic. Gynecologically, you will uh, look at the ovary, fallopian tube, parametrium. So you may find uh, ovarian cyst, para-ovarian cyst, paratubal cyst, ovarian torsion, ectopic pregnancy, uh, PID as a part of the upper genital infection. Sometimes tube ovarian abscess is seen also in these cases. The same applies for the left side regarding gynecology, but for GIT here in the appendix, the left side has no appendix, it has colon, so it may uh, be a cause due to colonic cause like diverticulitis or ulcerative colitis, constipation, extension. Uh, these are the different causes regarding GIT, but renal and gynecologic causes are the same from right and left sides. So if you look to the anatomy, you have to think of what is the cause of pain. And this is the, your target, your task, as a doctor, when the patient presents to you with acute pain or chronic pain, you have to think of the cause of pain. Also, don't forget that sometimes organs are free, but the patient may have some psychosomatic problems, neurologic problems should be put in mind and diagnosed, of course, after exclusion of the organic causes of pain. Okay, I face the case with acute or chronic pain. What to do? You have to uh, analyze the pain from the symptoms of your patient. What is the onset of pain? Any symptom should be analyzed as follows. Onset, course, and duration. Regarding course of pain, is it increasing with time? It is called crescendo or the same pain for the same duration, this plateau, or decrescendo, which means it started strong and decreases with time. What is the duration of pain? What is the location of pain? Which region? Uh, is it localized to this uh, uh, point or region or referred or radiating to uh, other uh, parts? This is very important. What's the nature of pain? Is it colicky in nature, uh, sharp or dull aching pain, stabbing pain and so on? What, is the, what are the associated symptoms with pain like nausea, vomiting, back pain, uh, 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 renal pain, and so on? What increases and what decreases? What relieves this pain? What is the position of relief of this pain? And what, decrease, uh, uh, what increases this pain, coughing, sneezing, and so on? And what is the history of you regarding pain? Uh, did uh, this pain occur before? And what was the outcome? And so on. Importantly for pain, uh, which is different from other symptoms like headache, like uh, nausea, vomiting, and so on, this are uh, the schedule for analysis of any symptom. But importantly for pain, we have to analyze the severity of pain. And severity of pain, you have to stress on what's called the scale or score of pain. If you have a different patients with pain, what is the level of this pain? You have to find out a, a method to evaluate the uh, degree of pain or the severity of pain. And the commonest is visual analog scale. You mean that you give your patient a paper, started from zero, which means no pain, and ends at uh, worst pain. And you have to tell him or tell her to put with pain, what is the location of pain from no pain to severest pain? She puts the 
tip of the finger of the uh, of the pin into this point, for example, or that point, and so so you can find it is twenty percent, it is thirty, it is forty, and so on. This is called visual analog scale. It is fast, easy, simple method for assessment of the severity of pain. Others including numerical rating scale, but it is insensitive to small changes in pain and intensity. Verb verbal rating scale, you ask the patient without any papers or so. You ask her no pain, mild pain, moderate pain, severe pain. And this is uh, actually uh, used with patients who are not uh, uh, educated or uh, with mild conjunctive problems. And face pain scale for young children or girls less than uh, seven years. But the severity of pain alone is not sufficient to assess the pain. It should be included in, uh, uh, in, in some issues, some, in some uh, uh, formulas to assess the pain as a general uh, term. Uh, pain intensity, okay, is good, but you have to assess the mode of your patient's behaviors, thoughts, beliefs, physiological effects regarding menstruation, their interaction with each other. This is multi-dimensional pain scale, and there are many pain scales which are known in literature regarding uh, McGill pain questionnaire and others. This is very important. So by the uh, multi-dimensional pain scale, the clinician uh, uh, is directed to treat all aspects of pain experience if he knows some idea about the mood, about the thoughts, about the physiology. Uh, regarding pain, regarding relationship to menstruation and so on. So these are pain uh, questionnaires and pain assessment methods. Now, the patient told me that she has pain with her acute less than three months or chronic more than four or six months. What are the important issues in the history uh, that should be stressed on uh, during uh, talking to your patient? Detailed sexual history if the patient is married or not. If she is married, she does have some problems during sexual intercourse, like dyspareunia or pain continues after intercourse. This means that she has a, a problem related to the genital organs, which may be due to pelvic inflammatory disease. Or if she is married, she may have ectopic pregnancy and Importantly, to know that ectopic pregnancy not always presents with periods of amenorrhea. Some, some types of ectopic pregnancy present before the missed period, which is ismic ectopic pregnancy. Also, past medical and surgical histories are important. If the patient tells you that she had an operation before one month, you have to expect that this pain may be related to the uh, operation due to adhesions, bowel obstruction, uh, uh, so if you find any uh, surgical operation for adnexal pathology, there is a risk of adnexal problem. Social history is then important, like uh, drug uh, uh, substance abuse, history of domestic violence, or high risk behaviors. Uh, you have to inquire uh, any previous imaging for this problem, like CT, MRI, ultrasound, or not. And of course, uh, the family history for pain is an important issue because sometimes it is uh, relevant if you find coagulation disorders or sickle cell diseases in the family. This may uh, pain may be due to internal hemorrhage, due to rupture of a uh, follicular cyst, or uh, uh, even uh, at the mid uh, uh, rupture of the follicle site due to coagulation disorder with internal hemorrhage. So the uh, previous history is important for assessing the patient with pain. What about the history of present illness? Okay, I assessed the severity of pain, other issues for questionnaire, for pain assessment. If I find the pain bilateral, I have to think of bilateral cause, either bilateral renal or genital organ cause, PID or renal cause, dysmenorrhea, you have to think of endometriosis, particularly a special type of dysmenorrhea, uh, congestive and spasmodic dysmenorrhea, uh, or congestive due to pelvic congestion syndrome or uterine fibroids, 
This pyuria, I told you, may be due to PID, due to endometriosis, ovarian cyst. This urea, uh, urinary tract, hematuria, urinary tract, left side, pelvic pain, diverticulitis, kidney stone, rupture, ovarian cyst. So the site of pain is important for directing you what is the cause of this pain. Your job is to search for a cause. This is very important for you as a doctor not to prescribe treatment for this pain. At this stage, you are to, uh, importantly, to know that you have to diagnose the cause of pain. So the cause of pain is important. If there is associated symptom like nausea and vomiting, you have to think of appendicitis, ovarian torsion, renal cause, uh, and so on. Uh, migrating pain from the periumbilical area to right lower quadrant of the abdomen, this is appendicitis mostly, uh, radiation of pain to groins, <clears throat> mostly uh, kidney or renal uh, or ureteric cause, ovarian torsion, right side of pelvic pain, appendicitis, urinary frequency, urinary tract, vaginal bleeding, ectopic, uterine cause, uh, discharge, uh, vaginal discharge, particularly offensive vaginal discharge, you have to think of PID. Regarding examination of your patient, you have to be systematic in your examination, general examination like pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and temperature. Uh, these are the vital signs, general outlook of the patient, facial appearance of your patient, uh, uh, general uh, systematic examination from the head to the feet of your patient, uh, uh, and then concentrate on the area of pain, which is pelvic pain, and you have to find out if you uh, see adnexal masses, you have to think of uh, corpus luteum cyst, diverticulum of the colon, ectopic, endometriosis, follicular cyst, uterine fibroid two, ovarian abscess, and so on. Uh, bilateral abdominal tenderness means PID, cervical motion tenderness, PID, fever, appendicitis, PID, pyonephrites, hypotension, ectopic pregnancy, rupture, hemorrhagic, uh, uh, ovarian cyst or any cause of internal hemorrhage, left-sided, I told you, diverticulitis, right-sided, appendicitis, vaginal discharge, PID. These are important issues for evaluation of pain, particularly acute pelvic pain. There are what's called red flag symptoms, which means if the patient is associated with one of these symptoms, you have to be very serious because this pain is alarming you that uh, I am a pain due to a serious problem. What are the red flag symptoms for acute pain? They include if you find patient with acute pain and pelvic mass or torsion. This means that or adnexal torsion or ruptured ovarian cyst and so on. Uh, acute pain with pregnancy. This is severe, maybe threatened abortion, maybe red degeneration of fibroid and so on. Acute pain, but postmenopausal bleeding. This is very serious or pain. Postcoital bleeding and acute pain. This is PID uh, or ectopic pregnancy. Abdominal distension and pain. This may be diverticulitis or uh, any co uh, severe cause of, of the abdomen or the colon. Inability to pass urine and pain, this means that acute cystitis and so on. So red flag symptoms are important in guiding you to be urgent, to have an emergency management of your case because the patient comes with pain and one of these uh, red flag symptoms. Okay, we have to analyze acute, uh, uh, acute, PI, acute pelvic pain. First and most important for any lady coming with acute pelvic pain and married, of course, to perform pregnancy tests. This is a basic step in all cases, even if she has no missed period, because I told you some types of pregnancy present before the missed period, before missed period. Okay, so pregnancy test is positive, so she is pregnant. And if it is in the first trimester, you have to define if it is intrauterine or extrauterine. If it is ectopic, proceed to treat ectopic. If it is intrauterine, this is mostly threatened abortion or corpus luteum cyst with pregnancy. And if it is a case of pregnancy, but later than first trimester, you have to think of placental abruption, placenta previa, round ligand pain on, or preterm uh, or abortion as well. 
uh, or preterm labor later on after the age of viability. So pregnancy test is crucial for differentiating your patient with acute pelvic pain into two groups, yes or no. If the patient has negative pregnancy test, this means that pregnancy is rolled out. Okay, if the patient is right-sided, lower iliac fossa pain with McPerny's point tenderness was positive rosing sign, which means that if you press on the left iliac fossa, the pain comes to in the right iliac fossa. This is going with a pin size, and you have to proceed to do uh, CBC, leukocytosis neutrophilia, uh, CT, and ultrasound to uh, find out the cause of, or to confirm the diagnosis of appendicitis. But if no right-sided iliac fossa pain, uh, but the patient has adnexal mass or unilateral adnexal tenderness on bimanual examination, this may be ovarian torsion or ovarian cyst rupture, and you have to proceed to do transvaginal sonography and to uh, proceed for treating this case. I did not find any pain in the McPernis point. I did not find any mass with the right or left sided, but I found during bimanual examination, the patient has cervical motion tenderness on bimanual examination. This means that the patient has PID. I'll discuss with you PID in details later on. But I did not find right electrosa pain, mass, tenderness or motion of the cervix, but I found uterosacral ligament tenderness or nodularity on bimanual examination. This goes with endometriosis. And lastly, I did not find anything of this during examination. She is not pregnant. What to find? I have to search for anterior abdominal wall causes, and this is due to the anterior abdominal wall myocytes or lesion in the anterior abdominal wall. So firstly, it's to rule out pregnancy. Secondly, rule out abinocytes. Thirdly, rule out adnexal mass. Fourthly, rule out PID. Fifthly, uterosacral nodularity. And lastly, uh, anterior abdominal wall causes like positive carnet sign, uh, which comes now. Carnet sign means uh, if you uh, elevate the head of the patient uh, and uh, or the legs of the patient and press on the abdomen, uh, uh, this me uh, and the patient feels pain. This means is the cause in the anterior abdominal wall due to contraction of the anterior abdominal wall muscles. Okay, what are the investigations? Okay, I now I have a patient was one of red flag symptoms. So I went to red flag causes. I don't have red flag symptoms. I examined the patient uh, and found no picture of amenocytes, no adnexal masses, no PID, no nodularity of Douglas pouch and uh, no carnet sign. What to do is to make some, uh, to order for some investigation like urine analysis, CBC, uh, pregnant cysts, as I told you, swabs for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas as an example or uh, as examples of sexually transmitted diseases. I have to do transvaginal and transabdominal sonography. We don't ignore transabdominal sonography because sometimes we have an ovarian cyst twisted, but with a pedicle and goes to the abdomen, not to the iliac fossa or the suprapubic area. So we have to do both transabdominal and transvaginal sonography. We can perform endometrial pipette sampling uh, or hysteroscopy if you suspect endometrial cause. You have to do some sophisticated tests for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And lastly, we can perform laparoscopy for uh, uh, some cases, tumor markers if you suspected uh, malignancy, some GIT uh, endoscopies like sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, uh, and lastly, CT, abdomen, or pelvis. To be a skillful doctor, you, sh you shouldn't order all these investigations for all cases. Your history taking, your assessment of your patient will guide you. I am quietly uh, 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 convinced that this is a case of twisted ovarian cysts. So I have to order some investigations 
uh, to go with my uh, diagnosis like CBC, like uh, preoperative assessment if I proceed to laparoscopy uh, and then go directly to laparoscopy. No need to, to order for swabs for chlamydia or amplification tests and so on. If you suspect PID, you have to go to swabs and to, uh, to go directly to treatment of PID as you will see now. If you suspect malignancy, you have to order uh, uh, tumor markers and so on. So the selection of the investigations depends on your skill in diagnosing this uh, case uh, prior to ordering. An example of the uh, causes of acute pelvic pain is pelvic inflammatory disease, which means infection of the upper genital tract, including the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, the broad ligament, the parametrium, uh, and the adjacent uh, peritoneum. This area, if it is inflamed totally or partially, this is called PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. So this is very important uh, part in our job. And if you find uh, uh, our practice in clinics, you will find a lot of cases with PID. The instance is on rise, reaching up to 2% per year for the whole uh, ladies coming to the uh, clinics of, of gynecology. And the most common cause is sexually transmitted infections. And sexually transmitted infections lead to a disease which is called sexually transmitted disease. So sexually transmitted disease is a recognizable disease state caused by sexually transmitted infections, but some Causes are atrogenic, like insertion of IOD, HSG, curettage, endometrial biopsy, and so on. The uh, PID is rising uh, nowadays uh, in the community, and you may find instance of up to 2% per year in the gynecologic clinics presenting with PID. And the main cause of PID is sexually transmitted uh, disease. And sexual transmitted disease is a recognizable disease state caused by sexual transmitted infection. So the infections lead to disease formation. And other causes of sexual of the PID uh, include atrogenic causes, 15% of cases due to insertion of intratrine device, HSG, uterine curettage endometrial biopsy and others. And this uh, differentiation between sexually transmitted diseases and sexually transmitted infection has been mentioned in a recent uh, uh, publication of the CDC, which is Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Sexual transmitted infections are infections up to around 20 infections or more caused by bacteria, virus, or parasitic. Parasitic including Trichomonas vaginalis, don't forget, and bacteria commonly, uh, uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, chlamydia, uh, syphilis. These are the commonest causes of bacteria, don't forget. And viral, of course, you know, HIV, HPV, hepatitis C is now included, uh, and hepatitis B and some other uh, infections like herpes. So if we go to the topic of PID in a practical way, the commonest causes of uh, PID include gonorrhea, chlamydia, and anaerobic infection. These are the commonest bacterial causes of uh, chlamydia and uh, of uh, PID. So if we would like to treat PID uh, empirically without any culture or without any swab, we have to think of the main causes, including uh, uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, uh, and anaerobic infections uh, as uh, causes of these uh, uh, lesions. What are the risk factors for PID, young age, multiple sexual partners, certain methods of contraception, including uh, uh, intratrine contraceptive device, previous history of chlamydia, 
or another sexually transmitted infection or delayed or decreased access for care. The transmission, of course, uh, ascending infection from lower genital tract because PID is upper genital tract infection, lymphatic or blood borne infections direct spread from the appendix or gallbladder, and some gynecologic procedures start by uh, cervicides ascending to endometrites, myometrites, salvingites, ovarites, tubo ovarian abscess, and lastly, peritonites. So the ascending infection leads to progression of the infection up to peritonites. And you have to know that PID has different forms and different types, including subclinical PID, acute PID, subacute chronic PID, acute on top of chronic tubo ovarian abscess. And you should know that subclinical PID is diagnosed in up to 60% of cases and the manifest form of PID in is around 36% of cases, severe in 4% of cases. And due to the importance of subclinical missed cases of PID uh, uh, are many and some doctors ignore the diagnosing PID in many patients up to 60% of cases, so the complications occur without uh, uh, notice from the doctor, without uh, taking care of the, of the patient. That's why I wrote a book chapter on the uh, uh, on the hidden forms or uh, uh, subclinical forms of PID as an underestimated serious health problem, and it has been recently published in one of the uh, textbooks. Symptoms of PID include pain, lower abdominal pain, acute or chronic, acute less than three months, chronic more than six months, chronic for coronal causes like tube ovarian uh, abscess or masses, uh, masses, not abscess, abscess is usually presenting with acute, maybe due to, may present plus other symptoms like bleeding, dysuria, nausea, vomiting, fever, dyspareunia and abnormal vaginal discharge. Uh, uh, these are the main symptoms uh, of PID. Again, the CDC uh, mentioned some criteria for diagnosing PID, including minimum criteria like adnexal tenderness on examination, cervical motion tenderness, uterine tenderness, and these three forms of tenderness occur uh, during uh, bimanual examination of your patient. And additional criteria helpful for the diagnosis if you find severe tenderness of the uterus and cervical motion tenderness or adnexal tenderness and hyperthermia, more than 38.3 uh, Celsius in your patient, so you have to think of PID. Additional criterion also, abnormal cervical mucoperion discharge or cervical friability. Additional criterion, presence of abundant numbers of uh, white percopacid leukocytosis on saline microscopy of vaginal fluid, elevated ESR, C-reactive protein, laboratory documentation of cervical infections with gonorrhea or uh, chlamydia teracomatis. All these are additional helpful to you when you are doing bimanual examination, but the main uh, uh, criterion were called major criterion uh, of criteria for diagnosing PID include cervical motion tenderness, adnexal tenderness, or uterine tenderness. But the definitive diagnosis for PID after this uh, provisional diagnosis of minimum and additional criteria is definitive. The criterion is endometrial biopsy for histopathologic evidence of endometrites, laparoscopy for PID evidence, transvaginal sonography, and MRI. These are the definitive criteria for PID. In this short movie, you can see the right tube. Uh, we grasp the right tube and here some congestion and some hemorrhagic fluid, and you uh, make suction irrigation of this fluid. And there are some mucopurulent discharge and inflamed surface of the uh, fallopian tube. 
and the ovary and the uterus as well, and also the anterior uh, part, which is uterovesical pouch, is sh showing inflammation, mucopurulent discharge, and uh, fine adhesions due to acute PID. These are criteria for acute PID and should be put in mind when you are doing uh, laparoscopy. The PID has stages, stage one, which is uh, acute salpingitis without peritonitis, stage two, acute salpingitis with peritonitis, stage three, acute salpingitis with superimposed tubal occlusion or tubal ovarian complex, stage four, ruptured tubal ovarian abscess, and of course, stage five is tuberculosis, tuberculous salpingitis. Now, the uh, complications of PID, it is not just inflammation. Inflammation of other genital organs, tubes, ovaries, uterus, peritoneum, can lead to chronic pelvic pain, can lead to infertility, ectopic pregnancy, recurrent pregnancy loss, and adhesions in the peritoneum. And one of the common findings in PID patients is to look by laparoscopy to the uh, perihepatic area, and you can find some fine adhesions attach it between the liver and the anterior abdominal wall, and these are called fitz who cortis syndrome uh, uh, after the three doctors or scientists who described these adhesions, Dr. Fitz, Dr. Who, Dr. Cortis, described fitz who cortis syndrome, which is perihepatic adhesions uh, in cases of PID. How to manage PID? PID is a serious problem inflammation of the upper genital systems that may lead to pretonites and systemic shock, and the patient may die. So if you don't save your patient early, the patient may be lost due to systemic shock, and the patient would be in a bad situation. Less than systemic shock is infertility, tubal occlusion, and so on. So our target is to diagnose the case of PID based on CDC criteria, minimum, additional and definitive criteria, and to relieve the acute pain, eradicate the infection, minimizing the risk of long-term consequences of PID, as uh, I told you. So PI, acute PID is an exception for medical practice, which means that, okay, I know that the case was minimal, criteria, additional criteria, and definitive criteria is mostly PID, but I have to be sure to give the patient treatment. So we have to wait for culture, for gonorrhea or chlamydia or other infection, and we have to do some sophisticated tests like amplification tests, and waiting for the results. It comes after three days, the lab says to you, it, okay, the culture will take three days. And in these three days, the patient may be lost, and the patient may die due to the acute pain and the acute PID. So the recommendation of the CDC is to start empiric treatment. Don't wait for the culture. You have to take swab, okay, and send to the lab, okay, this is good. But you should start immediately antibiotic without waiting, without any reluctance, to save the patient and to save her genital organs from damage by this acute inflammation. So this is an exception. Usually in medicine, we diagnose by clinical examination, uh, by investigations, and then we start treatment. But in acute PID, we start treatment immediately. Don't wait for the result. If the results comes, if the result comes in accordance with your selection of antibiotics, okay, this is good, I have to continue on this course. If the results come with a different organism, you have to switch to another organism, but you made your best to save the patient's genital organs from the serious effect of the acute PID. As I told you, the main causes of infection are chlamydia, gonorrhea, and anaerobic infection. So if you select antibiotics empirically, you should put in mind the, these organisms. So it is an emergency treatment, an emergency treatment. And all regimen must be effective against chlamydia, gonorrhea, 
as well as gram-negative organisms, anaerobes, and streptococci. Some cases of acute pain and acute PID, I have to admit them to the hospital. What are these cases? As I told you, acute PID, okay. But some cases of chronic PID should be admitted to the hospital if they have tube ovarian abscess, if uh, you suspect possibility of appendicitis, if you uh, find PID in a patient who is pregnant, if the patient is unable to follow or tolerate an outpatient oral regimen without clinical response to oral antimicrobial therapies. These are the indications for admission of the patient to the hospital. But the uh, CDC also puts some empiric regimens for the PID until the cultural sensitivity. The parenteral treatment, which is intravenous treatment, followed by oral treatments. So parenteral treatment, you have options. You have regimen A, B, and C. You can select antibiotics for the regimen A, B, or C. You have free selection according to your suspicion of the a possibility of any organism in your case. So regimen A containing a second generation cephalosporin, which is cephotitan, two grams intravenous every 12 hours, plus doxycycline, which is for uh, uh, chlamydia, uh, doxycycline 100 milligram orally or intravenously every 12 hours. Regimen two, cephotitan, which is also second generation, two grams and so on with doxycycline. Regimen C, clindamycin, if the patient is sen uh, has some hypersensitivity to cephalosporins, you can prescribe clindamycin 900 milligram intravenous every eight hours plus gentamicin two milligrams loading doses and followed by uh, 1.5 milligram kilogram dose every eight hours. Alternative regimen for those cases, if they are, have some hypersensitivity or these drugs are not available, you can prescribe ampicillin sarbactam combination, three grams intravenous every six hours plus doxycycline for chlamydia. This is the parenteral, the initial treatment if the patient has acute PID and after uh, at least one, hour, one day of improvement of, of the symptoms of PID, fever and so on and so, you can switch to uh, oral treatment. Oral treatment has different regimens as well. Regimen A, B, C. A is to prescribe uh, uh, cifetrexone, uh, 250 milligrams intramuscular in a single dose, plus doxycycline, plus minus metronidazole for anaerobes. Regimen B, cifoxetine, two grams intramuscular and propenicid, one gram orally in a single dose, plus doxymycin, plus minus metronidazole. And regimen C, a third generation cephalosporin plus doxymycin uh, and uh, or doxycycline plus minus metronidazole. These are the different regimens proposed by the CDC to put the doctors in a good way to cover most of the possible causes of PID, including chlamydia, gonorrhea, and anaerobes. And you should know that uh, the generations of cephalosporins are five. And here we used uh, cif uh, cifotitan and cifoxetine, cifotuxone, second and third generation cephalosporins. But there are five generations of cephalosporins according to the spectrum of uh, uh, their actions and these are developed by different companies. And this is summary of the uh, different regimens. Okay, as I told you, after clinical improvement, at least one day of uh, uh, stoppage of the symptoms, the, the regimen is usually uh, three days and improvement. This means that you have to switch to oral treatment uh, after 24 hours uh, of clinical improvement and continue oral treatment, uh, uh, the same oral treatment, uh, and, and then repeat testing of all women diagnosed with chlamydia and gonorrhea uh, frequently at six months at least. Indications of laparoscopy and PID, not all cases of PID are treated by laparoscopy laparoscopy after failure of the antibiotics, of course, and or some cases of tube ovarian masses, abscess, or perforation of the abscess with peritonitis, 
So you can do laparoscopy for peritoneal uh, toilet and uh, drainage of any abscess and adhesolysis, of course. And the abscess is one of the serious complications, biosalmics, and so on. So these are important uh, issues for PID. Now we move to another cause of acute pelvic pain, and it is an emergency, which is ruptured ovarian cyst. Uh, it can occur spontaneously or after intercourse, after trauma to the abdomen and presenting with pain, plus low-grade fever, pelvic hematocele, sometimes affecting of the general condition by uh, uh, hypovolemia due to massive bleeding. And this is an example of rupture ovarian cyst or rupture follicle causing internal hemorrhage. We have a lot of cases with internal hemorrhage. Another example of acute pain is ovarian torsion. Sometimes the ovary uh, twisted on its uh, uh, axis, leading to complete or partial rotation of the ovary on its ligamentous support. And it can occur in a young age or uh, a reproductive age. And the risk factor actually uh, are including uh, an axial mass or cyst more than five centimeters, uh, ovulation induction history of torsion, pregnancy, or PCO. And these are the pictures of torsion. You know the ovary or the adnexa rotated on its apex several times to make rotation or torsion uh, of the uh, adnexa. And this is the start of torsion. After some time, the adnexa will become congested like this color and congested and some doctors consider it gangrenous and some of them excise them. But if you make detorsion of the adnexa, you will find this uh, black adnexa vascular with bleeding on touch. So uh, we don't have to be hairy in doing uh, excision of the adnexa unless uh, uh, the tissue is confirmed. And these are the examples of torsion and after detorsion and fixation of the ovary. And this is a short movie to show you the adnexal torsion. Here is the left uh, adnexa adherent to the uh, uh, omentum. The seal is omentum, and this is uterovesical pouch. Here is the uterus, and the uh, adnexa is adherent due to inflammation. And this is the column, the, the column. So the, we are trying to dissect the adnexa from the pelvic colon and omentum. And this is right tube and right uh, adnexa. This is the rest of the uterus. This is the round ligament, this uterovesical pouch. So we are trying to uh, dissect the adnexa from the omentum and colon. And then we start to make what's called detorsion. Here is the torsion side. Look to the tissues here are red, here are brownish, uh, are bluish. This means that the site of torsion is here. This is red, this is blue. So here is the torsion site. We have to make detorsion of the uh, uh, adnexa, here is tube and ovary. Actually, this is a case of huge hydrosalmics as the cause of torsion. And this is the fimbria, the dematous and congested fimbria. So detorsion is important in, uh, 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 and this is ovary, and this is ovary was adherent in the pouch of Douglas. Uh, this is the stigma of ovulation of the left ovary. And now we are trying to make detorsion of the ovary and tube to uh, relieve the, uh, this condition. Look to the tissues are bluish or Twisted tissues are bluish in color, sometimes black in color, uh, and doctors should not be uh, uh, heroic in excision of the adnexa, particularly for young girls, because uh, many cases of torsion after detorsion and fixation will have a good uh, functioning adnexa, and some case reports of induction of ovulation and the ovaries. Uh, of the twisted side uh, uh, produced follicles for in vitro fertilization and so on. So it is important. Here is the ovarian ligament. Yes, ovarian ligament now is grasped and rotated. So 
the anatomy starts to be the ovary is medially, the fallopian tube is laterally, and we push the ovary in its normal place. And now the fallopian tube is uh, uh, consisted and looks to be very pathologic. Of course, this case has hydrocervix, huge hydrocervix. Should we should excise at uh, this site? Another cause of acute pelvic pain with post pregnantist is miscarriage, as I told you, abortions with different forms. And don't ignore pregnancy tests for these cases. Uh, also, acute pelvic pain with uterine enlargement due to fibroid uh, presenting with acute pain due to degeneration uh, or torsion of pedunculated subserous myoma, uh, uterine inversion, some vaginal bleeding with, uh, uh, with uh, fibroid. If Fibroid complication during pregnancy, which is red degeneration, is treated medically, no need for surgery in pregnancy. Uh, examples of uh, acute pelvic pain plus positive pregnancy test, uh, of course, should include ectopic pregnancy. And I invite you to go to the uh, channel in the uh, YouTube to find some lectures on the importance of discriminatory zone in ectopic pregnancy the uh, pulsating ectopic pregnancy salpingotomy procedure or tubal milking procedure by laparoscopy. All these are the links for the videos on the internet. Now we completed the case of acute pelvic pain with red flag symptoms or without, and mostly uh, the cases are due to either pregnancy complications or non-pregnant. Mostly for us is PID, or torsion of the adnexa or ruptured ovarian cyst or uh, 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 any uh, degenerated fibroid complications or, uh, and so on. For pregnancy, of course, ectopic and threatened abortions. Now we have another patient coming to the clinic with a presentation of chronic pelvic pain, more than six, six months. Uh, presenting of this chronic pelvic pain. The story of chronic pelvic pain differs from acute pelvic pain. Why? Because in most cases of chronic pelvic pain, we don't find a definite cause of this pain. So it is mentioned to be a state of pelvic pain rather than a specific disease. But in acute pelvic pain, you find out a cause which is acute appendicitis, acute PID, and so on. But here in chronic pain, the patient presenting for one year, two years of pelvic pain all the time or part of the time increases with any behavior or so. And you have to find out a definite cause. It's very difficult to find out a single cause for this chronic pelvic pain. So if you have a patient with chronic pelvic pain, you have to be broad-minded in analyzing this pain and you have to search for a state of pelvic pain, psychological, neurological, you have to myoskeletal, you have to search for organs in the heart, abdomen, and sometimes you don't find any cause in the patient and you find uh, just psychological problems for her. So, Often you don't find a specific etiology in the absent, absence of any etio clear etiology of this chronic pelvic pain. It is considered a regional pain syndrome or a functional somatic syndrome and a biopsychological approach is indicated in such a case. So chronic pelvic pain is a complex neuromuscular psychological disorder. It's a common, actually more common than acute pelvic pain up to 27% of cases of presenting to the clinics are due to chronic pelvic pain. In 50%, no single etiology or definitive cure. In 50%, report of a history of sexual, physical, physical or emotional, emotional trauma uh, is present in one third of cases, positive screening results for post-traumatic stress disorder. So it is a complex state of uh, presentation of chronic pain in the pelvis. If we'd like to concentrate on gynecology, okay, gynecologic causes of chronic pelvic pain, including 
Metriosis, of course, adenomyosis, and mixed cell cyst, chronic endometritis, dysmenorrhea, gynecological malignancies, leiomyomata, pelvic congestion syndrome, pelvic inflammatory disease, and adhesions. Others, including other organs, as I told you. And these are examples of uh, how to analyze chronic pelvic pain. These are the organic causes, but don't forget that it is a state of mix of different causes and you have to be broad-minded when evaluating a case of pelvic, uh, chronic pelvic pain. Diagnosis, history, and examination, of course. As I told you, analysis of pain, pain score, and so. Limited laboratory testing, not so, too much investigations. Complete CBC, differential, ESR, urine analysis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and pregnancy tests are basic for all cases. Transvaginal sonography is highly indicated to identify pelvic or adnexal masses or adenomyosis. I don't forget transabdominal sonography as well, as I told you, sometimes a paroscopy or urologic consultation. What I, can I find during examination of a case of coronary pelvic pain? During abdominal examination, any triggering point, the key of success to reach for a diagnosis of chronic pelvic pain is to use just one finger to locate is this the site of pain or not, not to use all the palm of your hand on the abdomen. Do I have pain here? Here, no. You have to just to point for the pain. Do I have pain in this point or not? This point, this point, and so on. So for any triggering points, surgical scars you have to examine. And you have to differentiate between the visceral pain and anterior abdominal wall pain, as I told you, by carnet test. You have to also evaluate skin causes of pain. Sometimes the patient comes with chronic pelvic pain and the abdomen is completely free, abdominal wall is completely free, has no psychological problem, but she has skin problem, skin problem. If you make uh, just testing of the skin by cotton tipped uh, uh, tip, uh, test, and press on the skin, just on the skin, and she has pain. This is uh, cutaneous allodynia. Uh, so the cause may be in the skin and the anterior abdominal wall or in the viscera inside the abdomen. And you should do vaginal examination, which includes five steps, inspection of the external genitalia for any infection, any discharge, any blood, any prolapse, any masses coming for palpation of the external genitalia, like barcelin cyst, barcelin abscess, and any uh, uh, other masses for uh, uh, palpation of the vaginal walls for search for cysts, like infected cysts, or masses, or tumors, or so, for palpation of the cervix, for any abnormal cervicides, nodules, and follicles, a palpation of the, fol of the fornices, and lastly, by manual examination, in addition to speculum examination. So these are the five steps inspection of the external genitalia palpation of the external genitalia preparation of the vaginal walls and cervix, by manual examination and speculum examination. And you have to, when you are doing by manual examination, you have to assess the tonicity of the pelvic floor muscles. If they, uh, they are very tense and tender, you have to think of pelvic floor causes like uh, uh, my, myocytes or neurites of the pelvic nerves and so on. And lastly, you have to examine the back, sacroiliac joints, or pubic symphysis for varietal causes of pain. Uh, and this is the musculoskeletal organ, so origin. So you have to make examination thinking of what is the cause of this pain. Is it abdominal or back, sacroiliac joint, or symphysis pubis? Is it vaginal? You have to search for the cause for these by the different protocols of examination. And this is the carnet test, as I told you, elevates the legs of the patient or the head of the patient. And by one finger on the painful abdominal side, if increases, this uh, means that anterior abdominal wall cause. If no change, this is a cause uh, inside the abdomen, not parietal cause of pain. Some publications, particularly recent publications made what's called pain mapping to search for the cause using Q-tip uh, cotton uh, tip to locate the site of pain 
in vagina examination and they found that paraurethral area is a missed area for a cause of pain uh, in many cases. And this is my official change. And also the bimanual examination pointing with the finger in the vagina, what is the site of pain? Is it pudendal nerve? Is it uh, levator in eye muscles? Is it rectal? It is, is it uh, urethral and so on by finger inside the vagina? And these are the sites of referring pain from these sites. Also, examination of the bladder, neck, urethra, and these are the sites of these uh, causes. Okay, we have a patient presenting with chronic pelvic pain. Uh, for a long time, history, examination, and red flag findings. Again, postcoital bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, or pain, unexplained weight loss, pelvic mass, or hematuria. These are serious symptoms associated with chronic pelvic pain. Go ahead to evaluate for these serious problems, not to be interested in pain. Only search for the cause of these uh, red flag symptoms. And if the, you don't find any red flag symptoms, you should proceed uh, to find out a specific cause. If you find it okay, treat like endometriosis and adenomyosis. If no finding, you have to make some investigations. And if the investigations are normal, you can go to laparoscopy, particularly if pain is severe. And if the tests are pain are abnormal, like chlamydia, positive chlamydia, or gonorrhea, you have to go to uh, treatment. Limited uh, uh, evidence supports use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, cabalbutin uh, uh, or serotonin, norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors for treating uh, pelvic, coronary pelvic pain. Also, I invite you to go to the YouTube channel to find out some lectures on endometriosis for undergraduates. Uh, uh, to understand endometriosis and adenomyosis also has a separate lecture in the internet. I have to highlight an important uh, missed topic regarding uh, chronic pelvic pain, which is pelvic congestion syndrome as a cause of chronic pelvic pain. Pelvic congestion syndrome, a patient coming with chronic pelvic pain plus perineal heaviness, plus urgency of micturition, plus dysuria, dyspareunia, and postcoital post pain. The pain after intercourse is prolonged for a long time after intercourse. These associated symptoms with chronic pelvic pain uh, after exclusion of any organic cause like endometriosis, adenomyosis, admixal mass, and so on, you have to think of pelvic congestion syndrome, which is caused by ovarian or pelvic vein reflux or obstruction. The pelvic veins either have some problems in the valves, which is incompetence of the valves, or obstructed by compression or by lesion inside the veins. And as I told you, not only chronic pelvic pain, not all cases of chronic pelvic pain are pelvic congestion syndrome. Pelvic, chronic pelvic pain plus perineal heaviness, urgency, dyspareunia, and postcoital leading uh, pain, in addition to uh, 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 disturbed quality of life and reduce the social activity of the lady. It may be primary pelvic congestion syndrome due to pelvic vein insufficiency, as I told you, incompetence of the valves, or maybe secondary due to external compression. So it may be obstructed outflow of the veins, maybe uh, incompetent veins, and estrogen is an important cause, so it is common in the reproductive age. And I told you the presentations now how to diagnose it by ultrasound techniques, non-invasive transvaginal sonography. You can see very uterine veins, uh, but pelvic venous duplex ultrasound is more specific, particularly if done during Valsalva maneuver to accentuate venous filling. Uh, uh, you will find tortuous pelvic veins measuring more than six millimeter in diameter, dilute, dilated arcuate veins crossing the myometrium and communicating with bilateral pelvic varicosis, reverse caudal or retrograde blood flow or slow blood flow less than three centimeters per second. Invasive procedures including, uh, include contrast venography, and of course this and uh, doublex are done by the radiologists to find out the cause. And uh, thanks to the uh, uh, radiologic uh, intervention, the disease of pelvic congestion syndrome is now 
well established in medical practice. Okay, treatment, some medical treatments like hormones, like medroxyproducin acetate or GnRH agonist, or some studies on diazmine 500 milligram twice daily for four or two or six months are used for treating the case of acute of uh, pelvic congestion syndrome. If failed, we uh, refer the patient for uh, surgical treatment by the radiologist to make pelvic filipography. If reflux is seen, embolization is done, we insert embolus into the site of reflux. If compressed, you have to treat the cause of compression by mass or so. And if no cause, you can uh, make uh, a stinting of the uh, obstructed, uh, uh, obstructed vein. Now the treatment of coronary pelvic pain Syndrome specific management, if you find a cause, go directly to treat the cause like endometriosis, adenomyosis, and so on, chronic PID, and so on. But if you don't find, I told you, it is the commonest to don't find that you don't find a cause. So undefined cause, it should be multimodal treatment, not only single modal treatment, it's multimodal treatment to improve the quality of life of this lady. Baseline non-surgical interventions by some drugs, pharmacological, uh, specific role of empiric hormonal treatment, as I told you, some targeted interventions to relieve pain, non-surgical like pelvic floor physiotherapy, like Kegels, exercise and others, trigger point injection, nerve block, neurogenic acupuncture or cupping, and some recent publications on cupping uh, as a call as a treatment of chronic pelvic pain of undefined cause. Also targeted intervention including uh, includes uh, the surgical intervention like suspected pelvic pathology treatment, additional surgical procedures to reduce pain like presecran erectomy and so on. But we have also interventions for central sensitization or neuropathic pain maybe central in the brain, not in the organs at all, not in the pelvis. Pelvis is completely free, like neuromodulators, anticonvulsants, uh, uh, like tricyclic uh, antidepressants, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, uh, exercise, some psycho psychotherapy, and so on. So the treatment may be uh, defined cause, treatment, okay, syndrome, specific management, or undefined cause, which is treated by non-surgical interventions, hormones or pharmacology targeted, non-surgical and surgical, and some interventions for central sensation of neuropathic uh, pain, as I told you. Some doctors do uh, during laparoscopy, pre erectomy, as I told you. And previously we made a uh, uh, cutting of the uterosacral ligaments, which is called laparoscopic uterine nerve ablation, luna and chronic pelvic pain. And we published this study before 21 years, but recently or later, later of this publication, Cochrane Review analyzed the techniques uh, performed for this uh, procedure, even pre anectomy, they did not find any benefit for the patients in addition to some complications of the procedure. So we don't now we don't advise to do Luna for colonic pelvic pain. In conclusion of this talk about pelvic pain, you have to be a clever doctor to reach for a cause of this pelvic pain rather than treating the pain itself. So pelvic pain should be meticulously evaluated to, uh, to find out a definitive cause. Always put in mind red flag symptoms in acute and chronic pelvic pain to direct you to serious uh, problem, problems and to avoid empirical treatments except in diagnosed case of PID, don't proceed to go to analgesics without knowing the cause, except in cases of acute PID as recommended by CDC. In most cases of acute PID, prompt intervention results in dramatic improvement of pain, while cases with chronic pelvic pain require more detailed evaluation and you can find out this lecture on the YouTube channel out of under uh, out of dot Darwish and other lectures related to this topic on this channel. Thank you very much.